say. I don't sound like past mayors or look like them or think like them. And I say, yes, I don't. That is the point. I am not a conventional candidate, but changing it up isn't the risk. Electing the same kinds of people, bringing the same old broken promises over and over again, and expecting things will be different. That's the risk we can't afford right now. That was Maya Wiley, one of more than two dozen candidates vying to stand out in the crowded race to be the next mayor of New York City. This isn't any other mayoral race. New York City has a population larger than the vast majority of states. It's got the largest school district in the country and the social and economic devastation that the coronavirus pandemic has left on its five boroughs means whoever leads the city will have monumental tasks ahead. Think back to 2013 when current Mayor Bill de Blasio ran for office against people like City Council Speaker Christine Quinn and the shamed former Congressman Anthony Weiner. De Blasio really only had to campaign on bringing change after the Michael Bloomberg era, saying he'd address issues of income inequality and the NYPD's racially controversial policies like stop and frisk. Now, those aren't small tasks. They weren't small tasks. But in the age of this pandemic, that's only further amplified those kinds of issues and created new ones. Well, let's just say it's not a job many would envy having to handle right now. But it is a job that Maya Wiley, former counsel to Bill de Blasio, wants. She's also a prominent civil rights attorney, the new school senior vice president for social justice, and was a former analyst for MSNBC. Back in October, she announced her bid to run for mayor as an unconventional candidate. And Wiley's since been endorsed by New York City's largest union and one of its most influential. In an election dominated by who gets backed by which union, it's a big show of support. Last week, the city's freelancers union endorsed both Wiley and another candidate, Andrew Yang. And that's going to be a challenge for her. Yang, the entrepreneur who also ran in the 2020 Democratic presidential primaries, is currently leading the pack in several polls. And Eric Adams, the Brooklyn Borough president, is also polling ahead of her. If elected, Maya Wiley would be New York City's first woman to hold the office. And her campaign has said she plans to focus on racial justice, affordable housing, and educational inequality. But how will she handle the pandemic, which seems to be the number one issue for voters? And what are her plans to boost her candidacy before the primaries in June? Well, I'm delighted to say Maya Wiley joins me now to discuss as much as that as we can get through in the time we have. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Maya, you say you are not a conventional candidate. How so? What have you said or done so far that you would call unconventional? Well, first of all, Maddie, we've never elected a woman to be mayor in a city that has had 109 mayors. And I've never run for public wow. office before. And that in and of itself <laughs> makes me unconventional. But let's add the fact that I am and always have been a racial justice advocate and activist, a civil rights attorney. We have never elected anyone with that kind of background to be the mayor of New York City before. And I'm gonna change that. Um, let's see, Maya, in a recent poll, a majority of people surveyed said they thought COVID, jobs and homelessness should be the mayor's top priorities. If elected, how are you going to handle those priorities, especially COVID, differently than incumbent outgoing Mayor Bill de Blasio, your former boss? Well, let's start with the fact that we're going to not only be very transparent about what is happening, and, and I'm not suggesting the mayor hasn't been, but what I am saying is that our partnerships with community, we know that we were ground zero during COVID in communities of color in particular. If you were Latino in East Elmhurst or black or brown in the South Bronx, you were experiencing the highest infection rates, the highest death rates, the highest job losses, everything that we have seen that has been so devastating about this crisis. And we know that we have had the weakest vaccine penetration in these desperately needed communities. And that is an approach that required a yeah. geographic approach, right? Not just an approach. Yes, we had to make sure our seniors were getting the uh, opportunity to be vaccinated. Yes, we had to make sure residents of nursing homes and folks who had pre-existing conditions of any kind, absolutely. But we knew who was hit hardest, who was hit most, 
who our essential workers were and where they lived. And so having a geographic approach that also partnered with our faith-based leaders, mosques, uh, um, our synagogues, our black churches, all of the faith-based leaders we have in the city, as well as our community-based organizations, because those are trusted institutions and leaders and places where even if you don't have broadband access, even if you don't have a device, you can get the information and know that you can come in and get a vaccine. Yeah. That is going to bring us back stronger, safer, and also more fair and more just. According to that same Emerson poll, Maya, the most important issue for voters that are backing you uh, is actually police reform. And you've released an ambitious plan to shift $300 million in resources from the police uh, to help families pay for child and elder care, about 100,000 uh, of them. How do you think police are going to react to this? What do you think your relations will be like with the NYPD? Because Bill de Blasio had some pretty rocky relations with the NYPD, especially over issues of police violence, racial justice. I remember that famous scene where many of the officers turned their backs on him. What's your relationship going to be like with the NYPD and with the police union? Well, look, I was counsel to the mayor when Eric Garner had the life choked out of him by Daniel Pantaleo, and I worked for the mayor when those two police officers were brutally murdered here in Brooklyn, where I live. Uh, and both those things were wrong. <laughs> both of those things needed to be called out. The mayor did call both of them out. But here's the thing. When we have problems, we must fix them. And one of the problems we have is that we have expanded the size of the police department to solve problems policing was never designed to solve. Eric Garner's crime was allegedly selling a cigarette without taxing it. That was his crime. That means he was killed because he was poor. That's not a crime, nor should it be. But we also have so many people who have mental health illnesses. We should be making sure we're investing in crisis response from mental health experts because New York City police officers don't sign up for the job to be a mental health professional. It's not why they signed up. And what yeah. we have to do is right size the department so that the job is the job they signed up for, which is to go after illegal guns that are coming into our community. A lot of this is about fairness for all sides and recognizing what the job is and what the job isn't so that we have the money we need to invest in solving the problems that are not policing problems. So you're not worried about uh, members of the police union overriding you or trying to intimidate or even bully you? Well, look, I have been black all my life. <laughs> and that means I have been had folks who have told me all my life I'm wrong or all my life I don't deserve to be where I am or all my life that I am someone who doesn't count. And what I say is we all count. By the way, that includes New York City police officers. I believe in union. I yeah. believe in collective bargaining. I believe in workers, including our police officers, being able to come together and ask for fair work conditions, ask for fair wages. But at the point where you say, yeah. I should have absolute right to abuse the power that I have because I have a gun, then we're done. There's no more conversation because that's not public service. And well the said. public has a right to be safe. Well said. Aside from yourself, Maya, there are other big names in this race, including Andrew Yang, who a lot of people remember ran in the Democratic presidential primaries. He has no experience working in politics at all, although maybe that doesn't harm you in the current era. Uh, in 2019, Yang went on a series of right wing podcasts. And one of the things he criticized most was identity politics. Uh, he told Dave Rubin, for example, it's not a way to build consensus or bring people together. That identity politics is, quote, a stupid way to try and win elections. Do you agree with him? Well, look, it's for voters to decide what kind of leader they want. I am someone who's running as Maya Wiley. And that means I am running with all the experience that I have. And that experience includes being a change maker from the ACLU to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to Foundation World, to the U.S. Attorney's Office, to founding and running uh, my I, own. I understand, but just my, but my question was, do you agree with him that identity politics is stupid? 
I don't know what he means by identity politics. What I'm saying is we all come with a set of, of experiences. And where I was heading with this, Mehdi, was that I also have experience being a black woman in America. I'm not going to hide from that nor am I going to apologize for it. And the reality is it's actually incumbent upon every one of us to have a, to have and ask for a government that looks like all of us because our experiences do matter. And I don't think that's pandering. I don't think that's whatever people mean when they say identity politics. I think that's about being ourselves and knowing that we bring experiences and knowing what experiences we don't bring. I okay. was having a conversation with people with disabilities I am a person who does not have them. I know that I have to listen to folks yes. who have experience I don't have. Okay, let me turn to another issue, one of the biggest issues in politics right now. Earlier this month, uh, you put out a video statement uh, criticizing uh, Andrew Cuomo and also calling for the resignation of Governor Andrew Cuomo, Governor of New York State, in light of the recent uh, sexual harassment charges or allegations, sorry, uh, against him. Yesterday, President Biden said in an interview that we should presume the women are telling the truth, but Cuomo should resign if and when the investigations confirm the claims. Do you stand by calling for Cuomo to resign before the investigation is complete? I do stand by my call. I came by that very carefully. I came by that after a third woman came out with a pattern of allegations absolutely consistent with what we were hearing and with publicly available information that corroborated aspects of each of their stories. So what I have called for is not for criminal prosecution or for civil penalties. That requires an investigation. What I have called for is his resignation because of abuse of power. Because as an elected official, we, the people who voted for him, have given and conferred to him and lent him our power. And I believe we do have to restore trust in government and we have to hold our public officials to the highest standards. I think we deserve that. I think we saw that with Donald Trump. I think we saw that with uh, a Supreme Court nominee that I won't name right now, who's now a Supreme Court justice, Brett Kavanaugh. OK, there I did. I named him. Uh, but I don't believe that is about party. I believe that that is about principle. And so I hold to my principles no matter who the person is. I also say that everyone okay. deserves their own opinion, including President Biden. Okay, let me just jump in. One last question before we run out of time. Yesterday's attack in Atlanta, horrific attack. Six of the eight people killed were of Asian descent. We know that crimes targeting Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders have risen dramatically since the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, one recent study suggests hate crimes against Asian Americans from violence to verbal abuse rose by 150% in over a dozen cities last year, mostly in New York, the city with the largest Asian American population in the US. If elected mayor, how would you specifically address this issue? Well, look, first of all, hate cannot have a home here, period. And when I am mayor, I will not only be the person up front and out loud standing with our Asian and Pacific Islander residents saying that loud and clear. I will make sure that we are investing in the protection of all of our communities and in particular those who are Asian and Pacific Islander. Jewish, we've had a tremendous rise in anti-Semitism, anti-black violence, yes. anti violence, also Islamophobia. But whatever the hate and particularly, yes, for Asian communities, we will make sure that we are investing in protection necessary. I have been listening to leaders about what they are asking for. One of the things they're asking for is that we invest in community-based organizations that provide bridges, that ensure that we're supporting and training yes. people on being upstanders. Because as we saw with one man who was slashed with a knife on a subway train in our city, that there were folks on that train that didn't know how to stand up take the videotape, know how to protect themselves and protect him, call for help. Yeah. We have to become a city where we know how to respond, are supported okay. in responding and building bridges. Well said. We're going to have to leave it there, though. Maya Wiley, New York City's mayoral candidate, thank you so much for your time tonight.
Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.